I speak Korean, so I apologize that I am, uh, I, I will not be as amazing, but uh, <laughs> stay, stay with me anyway. I have 3D printers and other toys to talk about. Uh, so I'm talking today about uh, digital fabrication, open source hardware, and creative commons, and basically how they're so into each other, about how all these communities are coming together and really building some amazing things. And at the very end, like, you know, sometimes, Usually, when you're when you're so into someone, it's great. It's like a great thing. But sometimes, you know, you can be too into someone. And so, at the end, I'm going to kind of mention a couple of the things that are happening as as these communities are coming together. And I see them really as the kind of problems that you have when you are too successful. But there are things that are worth. There are interesting things that are happening that are worth talking about anyway. Uh, and if I've learned nothing from the last uh, couple of hours in this room, it's that this clicker is not going to work. And so, also bear with me. Um, so, just as a sort of an introduction, uh, as as was mentioned, I am uh, right now. I work with a company called Shapeways. It's a 3D printing company, and uh, I am also on the board of the Open Source Hardware Association. Oh, there we go. Um, there we go. So that's sort of where I'm coming to this from. Before I was at Shapeways, uh, a couple of months ago, I, for a long time, I've been working at an NGO in the United States called Public Knowledge that did a lot of work on, on IP policy, a lot of great work with Creative Commons. And so this is sort of from that perspective, both from Shapeways and from the 3D printing world, and then also from the Open Source Hardware Association world. That's, that's where I get a lot of this information from. And I said at the beginning that I'm going to talk, talk about uh, digital fabrication and not just 3D printing. And I think that's because 3D printing is fantastic. Uh, it's a lot of fun. But if you're only thinking in terms of 3D printing, you're, you're missing some of what's happening. And so I want to expand it a little bit. Uh, I, you know, it used to be when I talked about 3D printing, I'd have to spend the first 10 minutes explaining to people what 3D printing was. Uh, at this point, I find that people have, are generally familiar, or at least they've heard of 3D printing. But I want to give everyone kind of the, the full picture of where we are right now in terms of accessibility. So most people know 3D printing, if they know it at all, as a technology that is tied to machines that are, are desktop size machines that print in plastic, that's like Lego style plastic. And those machines are fantastic. They're, they're doing amazing things, but they are, the entry to the entry of 3D printing. There's also a number of other machines. They're, they're much more expensive, but they can print in all sorts of things. So, uh, you know, in the, in the top left there is one of the desktop printers that prints in plastic, but there are also 3D printers that can print in, in precious metal and things like gold and steel. Uh, they can do full color. And these are much more kind of industrial printers. And the important thing to think about with these, in, in addition to the breadth of materials that they can use, is that they act as a bridge between a digital environment, a virtual design space, and the physical world. And that's part of what makes them so interesting, is because you're working in a digital space, you can work collaboratively. You can share with people over, all over the world, just like every other digital object that we deal with. But then there's this translation moment where through 3D printing, if it's doing with 3D printing, it then gets built up layer by layer into a physical object. So you can have people all over the world collaborating on a physical thing together. Or you can have someone who is building on the work of a physical thing from someone that they will never, ever meet. And so that's what's happening in this space. Uh, in addition to 3D printing, the rest of the digital fabrication universe is worth keeping in mind. The, the two other obvious tools are a laser cutter, and that's the piece in the left. A laser cutter sort of works uh, in two-dimensional space. You design something in two dimensions, you put a piece of material into the machine, and then it will cut it with the laser. Uh, and, and then you can pull it out of the machine. And you can actually use that technique to build all sorts of 3D things as well by building pieces that fit together. But that's another important tool in this digital fabrication toolkit. And then finally, uh, a CNC mill. And so if 3D printing is additive manufacturing where you insert a file and it gets built up layer by layer, 
a CNC mill, you put a block of material in and it's subtractive manufacturing, they cut it away. And so with these three tools and then uh, virtual uh, design software, you can build all sorts of amazing things. Uh, so, you know, Blender's, these are all free. O uh, Blender is open source. It's a 3D design software suite. It's incredibly powerful, sometimes for people like me, maybe a little too powerful, uh, but, <laughs> but it's fantastic. You can do amazing things. Uh, Inkscape is, is for 2D design. So again, if you're thinking about laser cutters, you can do things with that. And then actually Autodesk has released a, a whole suite of free design software that is very powerful and a great entry to this. And so it's really with all of these things, with these open tools, uh, both digital and physical, we're seeing this community really embrace it. And one of the things that's happening is this is a maker community. This is a community that really loves Creative Commons and has it built into their DNA at a really fundamental level. And that's really inspiring. If you think about when Creative Commons was starting, I don't think that a lot of people at that table, I wasn't there, but I suspect that a lot of people at that table were not thinking about this kind of digital manufacturing, this kind of sharing, but that's definitely what we're seeing. That's definitely what's happening. And these communities, they don't even realize often how much they've internalized the Creative Commons ethos of what's going on. And that's a great outcome, I think. So I wanna give you an example. Um, so the, the, the best place to go right now online to get 3D printable objects is a website called Thingiverse. And built into Thingiverse is Creative Commons licensing. And this was built in from the get-go. I don't think they had any conversations with Creative Commons. They just, the people who were building the site were just assumed that the, what they would need is Creative Commons licensing. And that's what the community demands. And so as a result, First of all, you have this incredible wealth of 3D design, 3D printable things that all have Creative Commons licensing really prominently displayed. And so it's very accessible. It's almost Halloween, so we got some Halloween stuff. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of great to see it because people just sort of do it uh, by default. They, they, they have an option to choose the license. Creative Commons is very, very prominent and it has a huge uptake on the site. And what that means, because of the way the site is architected and the community works, is that there is a huge web of things that are not just released under Creative Commons, but you can actually trace how they've been inspired and remixed and built upon each other in a way that is just really core to how things are operating. So a good example of this is uh, early in, the, in desktop 3D printing, there was this model, it was Octopus, people really liked it. it, it printed well on desktop 3D printers a couple years ago, and it kind of looks neat, and so it was very popular. And as you can see, uh, it, was, it was very permissively licensed, and so what we started to see was people were immediately started remixing it. And so you have an octopus, and they had, okay, let's, let's put a head of a goat on the octopus, because, well, why not? You know, I, I can do it, the tools are free, I can print it at home. Um, and then you also got things, uh, you, got, you got cats, uh, cat head, believe it or not, uh, the 3D printed cat head is popular on the internet. Uh, people like it on the internet. And so the 3D printed cat octopus got really, really popular. And then uh, you can sort of see on the right, there's a, also an octopus with, a, with this guy's head on it. And so, um, that got, that, that became very popular. The person whose head this is, is a, a guy named Stephen Colbert. He's a very popular television personality in the United States. Uh, and the character that he plays, or played until recently, was this sort of like pro-America, jingoistic talk show host. And so early on, uh, he got his head scanned uh, with an American background, of course, American flag background, and it was released under a CC public domain license. And so, as you can imagine, what happened as soon as this guy, who's a very popular television personality, released a 3D scan of his head, we started seeing sort of Stephen Colbert everywhere. Uh, we saw this is this is a a flag holder with an American motif on it, um, and then this is actually like a much more complex transformation. This is something that you can do because it's a 3D space, and so you can just make things, uh, th you know, you could print this out with probably a higher end 3D printer. But remember, it's a digital file that can be manipulated in, in all the crazy ways that all digital files can be manipulated. Uh, we also saw, this is, <laughs> I don't, 
So I, re I, noticed, I, I noticed recently, so this is, you know, obviously his head on a dinosaur, that he has this like weird like, pizza cutter tail thing that I don't, I don't know what the deal with that is. I hope it's, it, I, don't, I don't know. Um, but so we saw this all over the place, right? Because all of these things had been released under Creative Commons by default, and so the community just took it and ran with it. And so you can see this incredible wealth happening in the entire world of 3D printing because it's just, it's so core to the ethos and design, and this only is possible because of these amazing Creative Commons licensing tools. The other thing I want to talk about is what's happening with open source hardware. It's a very similar story. Um, as I said, I, I, I'm associated with OSHA, although this is just my, this is just my talk today. But um, open source hardware is a community that's come out of the world of Creative Commons and open source software. Uh, the translation from software to hardware or from photos to hardware is a little bit complex, and we're going to be talking about that on Saturday. But it's a community of people who are building hardware components, uh, satellites, all, so all sorts of things, who are coming together and, and trying to create the same sort of universe. And so what we start to see, uh, this is just, if you want to find out more, there's a, there's a definition at Oshawa. Oshawa has a website that talks more about open source hardware. Um, but so one of the most popular, probably the most successful open source hardware components is this Arduino? I heard it referenced in the earlier talk. I don't know how many. Has anyone? Have you? Are you familiar with Arduino at all? Cool. Okay. So yeah. So these are boards. You know that basically um, they listen to the world, and then they do things in the world, and that can be an incredibly powerful tool. Uh, the the board themselves are open sourced. Some part of it with Creative Commons, uh, and then the software is also the software that controls it is also very open. And so what you see is that. Arduino becomes the heart of all sorts of crazy projects. Um, you know, you can see the Arduino at the heart of dresses that have LEDs that light up when you sway. You can see it at the heart of drones or robots that climb up uh, trees. All sorts of weird projects. 3D printers um, have Arduino at the core. And so when Arduino was very openly licensed initially, first they started making modifications themselves. And they said, okay, Maybe you might want a giant Arduino board for doing something. Maybe you'd want a super tiny Arduino board. Maybe you'd want one that talks to the internet. So we're gonna kind of, we're gonna remix these internally. But then we started getting a community of people who were saying, well, we want Arduino for some other specific needs. And because they were super openly licensed, they started developing it. So this was a board that was developed because Arduino was switching some of the hardware and upgrading the hardware. Uh, but people said, no, well, we had all this stuff written for the old one, so we'll just make the red one, which is like the old Arduino. And, you know, you can find it, and it's, it's fine. It's, it's totally compliant. Um, we also started getting other, other, other specific remixes. So this is a board that's designed to work with conductive paint. So if you wanted to paint, like, a mural on this wall, and when you walked down next to the mural, uh, it, it played a song, depending on how fast or slow you were walking, or how tall you were, or if you were jumping up and down. Uh, that's what this is. This is an Arduino remix designed to do that. Um, we also saw incredible uptake with wearables. So people wanted lights or other things, sounds, sensors integrated into clothing. So they, we, there was an Arduino remix that was designed specifically for wearables, so you could just integrate it into your clothes easily and use that Arduino design stack. And if you understood Arduino, you understood this. We also saw people just make kind of like cool looking boards. Uh, <laughs> that's just, you know, this is the one that, that they wanted and, and great, it's totally compatible, it totally worked. And so in both the open source hardware and the open source and, and the 3D printing world, we're getting this this world of people who just have completely internalized the Creative Commons ethos, which is amazing. But sometimes you can love something too much. And so this is, these are some of the challenges that we are, we're running into. And again, I just want to kind of put a marker here. We're going to talk about it more at some sessions on Saturday. But um, for those of you in the audience who are kind of persnickety lawyers, you may be thinking to yourself, there are a lot of things that come out of a 3D printer. And there are a lot of pieces of hardware that are not eligible for copyright protection, which means that we're getting these licenses on being used for things 
but they don't actually license any rights. And this can create a number of challenges uh, for the licensor because they think they're putting a license on something that gives them some power over it, which in fact they don't sometimes. It can be a problem for the licensee because they maybe they are not gonna use something because there's a, there's a condition that they don't wanna comply with, but in fact, it's, it's kind of not protected at all. And so this is a challenge that, that's coming. And I mean, you know, you worry that people kind of think that they're doing something and they end up with, with, with a huge problem, but this is a really a problem of success. This is a problem what happens when what you're doing, what Creative Commons is doing has been so internalized with a community of people, they don't even realize that it can't just solve every problem in the world for them. And this is a great problem for ha to have, and it's, it's sort of a, a second generation problem for Creative Commons, um, and it's great because you have this huge community of super enthusiastic people, and one of the challenges, one of the questions is, how do you meet them where they are, and how do you figure out the best way to engage with them? Uh, so I will say that you know, as, as that problem comes up, uh, we did release a white paper while I was still at public knowledge that walked through some of those challenges of sort of, before you think about your license, how do you think about what you are licensing? And that educational component is something that uh, I think is gonna be a real challenge for the rest of, uh, for the next couple of years, as all these communities that are so vibrant really begin to engage fully with what is possible with Creative Commons. So uh, thank you, um, if you have questions, I guess we're taking questions later on. You can also hunt me down. I look a lot like this, so if you see me, if you see someone looking like this, it's probably me, and you can ask me the question in person. Thank you. Thank you. 네. 네. 어 제가 소개를 3D 프린터의 진화라고 소개를 드렸는데 사실은 좀 내용이 좀 생각한 거랑 좀 달랐어요. 어 오히려 이제 그 크리에이티브 커머스 라이센스에 대한 아주 아주 중요한 이야기들을 해 주셨는데 CCL이라고 하는 우리가 그, 지금 이 컨퍼런스를 통해서 추구하고자 하는 그 라이센스 덕에 그 3D 프린터에 있는 그 모델링 파일들이 얼마나 많이 진화를 하고 그것들이 얼마나 많이 변화할 수 있는지에 대한 가능성을 사실 많은 가, 케이스를 통해서 보여 주셨는데 마치 그 뭐죠? 그 터미네이터에서 새로 나온 모델 로봇을 보는 그런 느낌이 들었고요. 그리고 오픈 소스 하드웨어 어소시에이션이라고 하는 곳에서는 솔 이제 아두이노나 뭐 라즈베리 파이 같은 하드웨어의 어떤 오픈 소스를 통해서 또그 다양한 베리에이션들이 지금 수십 종류가 아마 넘는 베리에이션들이 나오고 있을 텐데요. 그런 것들에 대한 어떤 가능성, 그다음에 진화 이런 것들이 총체적으로 메이커들 그리고 우리가 무엇인가 만들어내는 것들에 대한 어떤 환경이 얼마나 잘 만들어지고 있느냐에 대한 이야기를 해주셨고 마지막에 해주신 말씀이 기억에 남는 게 그래서 크리에이티브 커먼스의 이 열정적인 이런 사람들이 어떻게 이런 것들을 더 많이 만들고 어떻게 더 많은 협력을 할 것인가에 대한 그 질문 굉장히 좋았다고 생각이 들고요. 자 이제 50분에 저희가 마무리를 할 건데요. 이제 제가 자리를 이동을 해서 그 저희가 이제 10분밖에 지금 없습니다. We have a just 10 minutes to have a get a question Q&A session. So Okay, don't be hurry. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, three speakers. So um, please raise your hand, and um, maybe we need a we need a uh, interpreter. So just please just hold. Okay, just when you got a microphone. Okay. Now, yep. uh, Michael. My name is Delia Brown. I'm from Australia. Um, as part of the CC movement, but I'm also a copyright lawyer for education. The three D printing stuff is uh, obviously become a, an issue in Australia, but interestingly, this is, is gonna drive you absolutely mental, is an issue that the collecting societies have recently raised with me. Uh, now, because in Australia, um, anything that's created is protected by copyright, we haven't got quite the, the, the test that you have in the United States, so it's been like suggested to me that perhaps our copyright sampling system should be adapted to capture 3D printing. My arguments back have been, one, first of all, most of the stuff that's being created actually is owned by the person created it, as the author of the work. My other argument is that sometimes if you're using scanners and then printing, the things that you're probably scanning and printing may not be protected by copyright because it's an industrial application and design. But it's kind of interesting that the Collecting Society's Copyright Agency in Australia is already thinking about this as being a potential licensing revenue. So I just wanted to put that on your radar. It's something that's been, and so what I probably will do now is go and get your, the public knowledge, um, 
publication, but I'm also now thinking about how do I do an information sheet that's going to help the average teacher in a school know what they can and cannot do, apart from me just telling them to go to Thingiverse, which is fantastic. Right. Yeah, it's, um, you, will, you will find, and we should talk afterwards, you will find that the, the adventure, the copyright adventure of 3D printing is a, a long and excited one. Because you have to remember, in addition to all those things which are spot on, um, you can at least have a conversation about the, if someone scans something, do they have a separate copyright in that scan, and, and so on and so on. So yeah, absolutely, it's something that uh, I think when, when people are engaging with it, the real challenge for them is to walk through what's actually new and novel and what is a slightly repackaged version of a, of a problem they've already solved long ago and are totally comfortable with. Mm. Um, my question is for you. Okay. Um, I will speak slowly for the okay. translation. Uh, basically, you described a remix of the MIT site mm. uh, using <coughs> the same logical frameworks. Yeah, right. Uh, what I wanted to find out, the advantage, was there anything else you tweaked apart from changing language to make it easier for Korean speakers? Was there any logic tweaks or it was just a language tweak? Secondly, the issue of girls and software. How are you addressing this? What's your monitoring of this? Because we see uh, globally there's supposed to be less interest from young girls in this area, though frankly I doubt uh, that logic. And then what are you doing about gaming? Because today it's all about gaming and this is just about software. The 어, 답변을 드리겠습니다. 어, 저 아까도 발표 때 말씀드렸던 것처럼 네. <웃음> 네. 어, 아까 발표에서도 얘기했던 것처럼 MIT 미디어 랩에서 개발한 스크래치에서 영감을 받아서 이 프로젝트를 시작을 했습니다. 네, 스크래치의 블록 코딩 언어를 그러니까 블록 랭귀지를 그대로 가지고 왔고요. 그걸 가지고 우리는 다양한 학습 컨텐츠들을 담은 플랫폼으로 개발을 시켰습니다. 발전을 시켰습니다. 그래서 아까 조금 보여드렸는데요. 아까 이제 게임을 하듯이 미션을 수행하는 여러 가지 단계들이 엔트리 컨텐츠에 들어와 있고요. 그리고 선생님이 직접 학생들을 관리하고 또 그들의 어, 클래스를 만들 수 있는 플랫폼적인 기능들이 엔트리 안에는 많이 들어 있습니다. 그래서 정리하자면 스크래치는 언어라고 생각하시면 될것 같고요. 엔트리는 그 언어를 가지고 종, 어, 종합적인 플랫폼을 구축했다고 생각하시면 될것 같습니다. 네. 그리고 두 번째 퀘스천에서 어, 소녀들에 대한 이슈를 얘기를 하셨어요. 근데 저희도 어, 개인적으로 제가 굉장히 관심 있는 분야입니다. 그래서 저희는 학생들의 어, 전체 성별 데이터 그리고 그 학생들이 프로그래밍을 한 그런 코드 데이터들을 지금 다 어, 분석을 하고 있습니다. 내부적으로. 그래서 여학생들한테는 어떤 프로그래밍 패턴들이 보여지고 있는지 그것들을 내부적으로 분석을 하고 있고요. 여학생들이 관심 있을 만한 컨텐츠, 교육 컨텐츠들을 제공하려고 노력하고 있습니다. 네. 그리고 굉장히 재밌는 사실 하나 알려드릴게요. 남학생들이 만든 프로젝트랑 여학생들이 만든 프로젝트 그리고 그둘 사이에 알고리즘에 굉장히 차이가 많이 있습니다. 여학생들은 대화하는 아까 애니메이션, 대화형 애니메이션을 굉장히 많이 만들고 있고요. 남학생들은 아까 보셨던 죽이는 그런 게임들 <웃음> 네, 가볍게 말씀드리면 죽이는 게임들 이런 것들을 좋아하고 있어요. 근데 내부적으로 디테일하게는 현재 연구 중에 있습니다. 네. 여기까지 답변이 되셨을까요? 네. 어, 저 3, 3D 프린터 관해서 질문을 드릴게요. 네. 네, 천천히 얘기하겠습니다. 네, 저기 그 법률적인 문제에 관해서 어드바이스를 해주신다 그래서 
어, 여쭙고 싶은데 사실 3D 프린터가 점차 기계적으로 값도 싸지고 있고 접근성도 높이기 위해서 이제 회사들도 굉장히 노력을 많이 하고 있는데 이게 법률적인 문제가 생기는 거는 위험을 어떻게 관리를 할수 있는가 이것도 굉장히 큰 문제라고 생각을 하거든요. 근데 이것의 답이 라이센스에는 있지 않다고 생각을 합니다. 그래서 예를 들면 3D 프린터가 굉장히 각광받는 것은 모든 재료를 통해서 모든 것을 것을 만들 수 있는 가능성이 있다. 이것 때문인데 그것은 굉장히 위험할 수도 있잖아요. 그래서 이제 위험 그러니까 회사 차원에서 위험한 재료들로 사용을 하지 않는 뭐 기술적인 제약이라든지 이런 것들을 따로 준비를 하시고 있는지 여쭤보고 싶어요. 어 uh, thank you for your uh, great presentations for your three people. And uh, actually my question is very similar to her. That's why I uh, thought it's better I give her a question right now and then you can answer uh, all together. So uh apologize. <laughs> and uh actually the uh with the property based approach uh, is very good to share the copyright. Without claiming the rights, the author right, right? How about how can regulate the securities or the social orders? For example, the, uh, uh, not only the 3D, 3D printers, and then uh, but also the open source, right? Open source of contents. Uh, actually, the what do you think is better, the self-regulated? Or the uh, like a uh, content uh, the database like uh, I, I don't I'm not a computer person so how can I say that like uh, Google or Yahoo or the uh, that kind of system regulate itself or the government outside they can monitor so uh, that's why because sometimes people can share their information how to make a bomb right so it can be kind of uh, filtered so do you have any idea about that? Thank you. So these, these, are, these are both great questions. Um, and I think you, when, to answer them properly, you need to think a little bit about who you are in that ecosystem um, and what your specific concern is. Because uh, you know, you're know you talking about the companies. In that context, it sounded like you were talking about the companies who make the printers. Um, and you, know, you were talking a little bit about kind of larger regulatory issues. I think that one of, and I'll wrap this up, um, I think one of the, the things to keep in mind is that screening for bad, however you define bad things at the printer level or at the service level is unbelievably challenging from a technical standpoint. Um, I can tell you, you know, the way that my company works is people upload things and we print them. Uh, and we do a lot of work trying to identify dangerous items, but a lot of things can be dangerous in a lot of different contexts. And so if you start blacklisting uh, things, you will inevitably block things that you want to maintain and, um, and then not block things that you wish you had blocked. And so thinking about it from a regulatory approach really is a question of where the kind of the place you can intervene is that has the least negative effects. Not because those concerns aren't legitimate, but because there's just huge knock-on effects if you, if you do it incorrectly. And so there's a real kind of conscientiousness and, and understanding of what the real problem is that you're trying to address. Okay, so um, actually time is almost up. So I'm gonna get a one last question for Ho Jun Song. So any, anybody, if you have, raise your hand. Okay. Thank you very much for an interesting talk. Um, I wonder if you have an opinion on uh, some artists suggesting that uh, they deserve to be paid, they deserve to earn living out of their own creation, and for that they need copyright protection or some other means. You mentioned almost the opposite. You, you almost uh, 
give up your rights so that you can create more. Yeah, that's like uh, my number one priorities. But uh, when it comes to make a living, you also have to think about how to make a living out of what you have done, right? Uh, for me, I was able to actually make a living uh, not directly from what I have done, like launching a satellite or knowing, knowing how to build a satellite, but actually being on a TV commercial and then I was able to make money out of that. But uh, it's, a, it's, I think, a really tricky question and it's, it matters to someone who makes a living out of what they have created. But there are also... There could be also another perspective of, like, let's say, if you, I want to create something, I, I want to go to other like uh, perspective, like uh, ex existential question, fundamental question. Then for them, I think it's better to give up, and then we can find another way of like make our living. For me, I really want to make a really nice uh, noodles to make a living, but if I really want to challenge something and I really want to push and trying to see other uh, worlds out of what I have created, then I would give up. But uh, it's just a matter of, I mean, it depends on person, I think. But if they, other people are, uh, want to make money or make a living out of it, like art has a certain systems, which I don't like, because, you know, it's not about also copyright. As long as you publish it, it's already copyright protected, right? But no one cares. It's actually about how you promote your work to, to get paid. It's not about copyright, right? So there's also politics going on, lots of things going on. But I, I really, I mean, if there are people who really want uh, to preserve their uh, values, I think they should. And it has to be uh, respected by all the other people. But I'm just, I'm just saying that if you want to do something else, yes. But it has to be protected, I think. Okay, uh, time's up. Okay, so I think uh, the uh, open source is quite, you know, key factor for the uh, our maker movement or, you know, creative commons, you know, things uh, for, you know, future philosophy. So uh, please um, help us more and collaborate with us for, you know, stick to make more, you know, creative world together. Okay, so um, please uh, give a big applause to the three great speakers on the stage. And, uh, okay. And thank you for your participation. Thank you. Enjoy another Let's Be Ben. A thousand years when all our bones have disappeared, and every word has been erased.